I had a very different type of out-of-body experience about a week ago, which I'll just come right out and explain and then comment on later. I laid down in bed after hours of working on the computer. I wasn't tired. I was maybe a little mentally tired, but physically I was fine. Uh, didn't really want to sleep. Just lay down for a moment. And as soon as I did, I began to feel a kind of a pulsing energy in my body, which I have felt a couple of times before, fairly recently, and only recently, uh, <clears throat> and thought, well, that's interesting, but I didn't really think about it more. But this time, the pulsing energy, when I kind of really focused on it, or r went with it, I guess you could say, I just rolled out of my body just rolled out <laughs> like it was nothing. It was the easiest out-of-body exit I've ever experienced. And it was su really surprising to me. And I rolled out, and I was out of my body, and I was surprised. I'm like, wow, that was quick and easy. And I found myself, as soon as I kind of paid attention to my surroundings, I found myself in what looked like a city, a, a very clean city, um, maybe like San Francisco 20 years ago or Seattle or one of these places or even New York but very clean and there were people mingling about it was a cloudless sunny day uh, <clears throat> and there was a, a woman standing near me and she began to speak with me um, and usually I don't interact with people when I'm out of the body but this all seemed so kind of pleasant and flowing that I was, I was open to communicating with her. And so we started to talk, and she moved to sit down at a little coffee table on the, on the sidewalk that had a little tent over the top for the sun, I imagine. And I noticed that the more she talked, the more incoherent she was getting, just slightly. And she was also perhaps getting a little more animated. And it became pretty obvious that she was really just ramping up kind of a rant. And it didn't matter if I was there or not. And it got to the point where she was making no sense at all. She was just kind of inco incoherently babbling about stuff that she was upset about, whatever that was. I, I left. I kind of gently walked away she didn't notice and I went into the building behind where the coffee shop was and it was like a big mall uh, very a really nice mall um, and I'm looking around and you know there's mall like things and stores and stuff and I I go up to the top and I notice that there's kind of an exit onto the roof and I go out there and it's basically like a playground it's not like sand but it is like adobe and it seemed very very casual and formal and there were kids children and kids playing around up there so it seemed like it was a playground and i i noticed not now i could at, on the roof of the building there was a lot of sky Obviously, I couldn't, I couldn't see any other buildings, just sky. But I couldn't see the horizon because the walls were higher than, my, than I was. So I tried to fly. I tried to levitate my body up to look over the walls to see what was on the other side of the walls. And I couldn't. I couldn't move. To my right, there were maybe four or five adolescents, like maybe, you know, 14 to 18 years old, something like that, sitting in the corner, kind of acting the way adolescents act, like hanging out kind of vibe. And one of them noticed I was trying to levitate, and he said, oh, no, you can't fly. That's prohibited here. So I'm like, okay. So I guess, so wherever I was, my abilities were limited by being in that place. It's like being there meant certain things were turned off. Okay, so I began looking around the sides of the wall and the, 
the side walls and the wall that formed the outside wall, kind of looking to see if there was a way I could maybe scale the wall to see what was over the top. And he noticed that also. And he said, no, there's no way out. We've tried everything. They've made sure you cannot leave. Okay, so now it's starting to sound a little ominous. <laughs> okay, nevertheless, I decided to walk over to the wall to investigate maybe a little closer myself. And the kids got up, and they kind of started walking behind me and with me, totally non-threatening, totally like, you know, kids. And they were being really friendly, and one of them in particular was being very friendly. <clears throat> and he started to kind of, not, not jostle with me, but he was kind of kind of touching me a little, our, 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 you know, shoulders were touching, and he got, I think he like maybe patted me on the back or something. And then I noticed, or I felt, that he, had, he had, was putting his hands in my pocket to see if there was something he could steal. And I grabbed his hand, and I said, hey, you know, what are you doing? And in, he didn't respond verbally, but he did respond by forcing his hand deeper into my pocket to try to get whatever was there, which, as far as I knew, there was nothing there. And at this point, we started to wrestle, which was the mistake. I was responding like I might respond in a normal human situation. I, I didn't respond like I was in an out of body situation which was a which was a which was unfortunate on my part we started to wrestle and it became a very aggressive very forceful fight we were not punching but we were really being forceful and as we were as our bodies were really tangled together he said don't touch my spine and I responded in a way that was really disturbing, especially later. In that moment, obviously, it seemed like the, the, the normal thing to do. Later, it disturbed me tremendously. And it was, this is very rare for me. But I responded with, your spine, I'm going to tear out your eyes. And I reached around. His, his head was kind of like here. Kind of mangled together, and I had him in kind of a, a lock like this. And I, with the other hand, I reached into towards his face and plunged my hand into his eye to tear out his eye. I mean, this was really, really violent and and over the top. And when I did that. My hand was here at one moment inside his head. and But then I noticed, I'm just looking at my hand. He had disappeared. I immediately popped back into my body. And my first thought was, what, what the hell was that? Why, why did I respond like that? But... Immediately after that, I mean, it was maybe one or two seconds after I popped back into my body. My eyes were still closed, but I saw and heard there was a a an, a, a glowing, um, glowing and smoking ember about this big flew by my face, and I could hear the sound of it burning, crackling, burning, hissing as it flew by my face and it was it was bright with dark spots of i guess charcoal like stuff this was really shocking because the vision was so clear and so deliberate and so random that it was it very much felt like and in that moment as well it felt like this was whoever I just fought with. This was the this was the entity I was just you know I I was I was attacking and he was 
kind of coming by to let me know he was still around. <clears throat> it took a couple of moments to kind of, I guess, come to terms with that. My eyes had been opened by that point. I closed my eyes again, and now I saw something that I hadn't, I've never seen before, but seemed relevant to this situation. Perhaps in the distance, it was, but there was a, a, a round disc about this so big. It could have been far, far away, and a very big disc far away, or maybe like a disc this big, closer. It was impossible to judge the distance, but it was a round disc. And out of this disc were these black smoke, like arms, like an octopus arms that were kind of coming out. And there were many of them, you know, 15, 20 of them. And they were spreading out from this disc. They were emanating from this disc and kind of like octopusy, snaky kind of movements. They were kind of engulfing my space and I don't believe it was just my space I believe they were engulfing the, the, the material dimension at least that's what it felt like this was also a bit disturbing because it's like well clearly this is some sort of intelligence or ent entity or energy or something that is uh, uh, obvious, maybe a bit male malevolent or maybe really malevolent, and has some intention on coming into this world, or at least coming into my world, possibly coming into the world in general. I got the feeling it was coming into the world in general, and I had just happened to be seeing it. It dawned on me later that this... this... I'm going to call it a fire spirit that I ran into in this, what was essentially a lower astral prison. It was a place nobody could escape, but it wasn't a horrible place. It was kind of like a nice prison, like a nice, like most nice cities are. You know, you're kind of stuck there. It's hard to get out once you're in. You, <clears throat> uh... This fire entity was one of these characters in this prison city, lower astral prison city. And then it dawned on me that this may well have been a jinn. Because the jinn, if you're not familiar with the legend, the jinn, when, when Allah made, the legend goes, when Allah made man from earth, he also made the jinn from fire. And there's good jinn and bad jinn. The, the Muslim jinn are the good jinn. They are helpful and not mischievous. And they are, you know, they are, are, are spiritual allies. And the kafir jinn are pretty much, you know, mischievous, bad, and downright evil and cause trouble. Okay, well, I, it was easy to to accept that at least metaphorically it seemed to fit but the weirdness doesn't stop there because I, after a few moments I, I kind of you know realigned myself I went back to the doing the work I was doing on the computer now I've been a computer IT person since the 70s so, I, m more than most people, understand that 99.9% .9 of the problems with computers are human error. And I take great lengths to make sure that I don't make those errors. And that if there's a technical error, I'm, I'm covered. My data is, you know, on a regular basis, it's backed up all around the world. This is like a New Zealand site and a Houston site, and I got a separate backup drive and a separate computer that everything gets mirrored to, and stuff goes in a repository, remote repository. So I mean, it is all over the place. But 
the, the particular project that I was working on, I'd been working on for maybe three days. It wasn't that big. It was a few pages of code. But I hadn't made any backups. I hadn't made any copies. There was just one copy. And when I went back and opened my editor, I noticed that the copy that was now the only copy in existence, there's a footnote to that, the only copy in existence was a copy from four days earlier when I very first started the project. Like, you know, a few lines of code, nothing else. Now it was like three or four pages. Here is a few lines of code. Okay. There's no, I can't, I can't, even if I accept that there is a human error factor here, it can't explain how one copy that had been updated to be four pages reverted itself to the, you know, the, the original, the few lines of code that the, that the project started with. The footnote I mentioned before was that to, it was, this was for like a, uh, some, a website thing that I was, personal website thing that I was doing. And I had sent a copy to the website in the United States. I'm actually in Argentina right now. This is San Clemente, Argentina. Beautiful, gorgeous day, and I'm at the beach. So I had sent a copy to the site in, in, in uh, the States so I could test it on a remote web server. And I pulled down that copy, and sure enough, it was full. It was a complete copy. It was everything that I had done up to the point that I had uploaded it. So this, this just added, to me, it just made things more confusing. The, and for the next week, maybe even two weeks, well, yeah, maybe one to two weeks, for the next one to two weeks, or maybe it hasn't, hadn't even been to, maybe it was like 10 days or something. All kinds of unexplainable, weird technical stuff was happening. And I, I have seen countless examples of weird technical stuff that's happening. And, you know, at, during my career as an IT person, it was, you know, it was part of my job to figure out and fix these weird, unexplained technical things. So I'm really familiar with the technical things that can go wrong. But these were very strange. Really strange. Like sentences rearranging themselves in crazy ways. Uh, literally words I had just typed that would then disappear. Not in front of my eyes. I would type them. I would move on to something else, go back to revise them, and they would be gone. Just very bizarre stuff like that. And I got, I don't know if it was slight paranoia or if it was uh, insight <laughs> or maybe both, but I came to the conclusion that my, my, my gin combatant, my, my, the guy I was, the, the spirit I was fighting with was messing with me. And I did a little more digging into how exactly gin do mess with people at least traditionally, how this been. And, not surprisingly, the jinn, besides causing all kinds of uh, um, um, weirdnesses that can happen in your life, apparently they can also do some time travel. They can actually change things in the past. Okay, so now I'm really convinced this was the gin that was that was messing with me but then there was there was another insight that came along with that which was in this material world in the the world of earth material this is not the domain of the jinn this is or the domain of any other spirits other than the material spirits that we are here 
this is our domain and there is a safety in this because I can understand why certain entities energetic entities could easily manipulate energetic information like the com computer signals the computer data that type of thing but once it's once it is entrenched in the physical form it becomes maybe difficult or maybe even impossible for a non-physical entity or a, a, an entity that does not have uh, the abilities in the physical world to, to mess with it uh, or to change it or to alter it. There was a certain security in the being physical that was kind of a new experience to me because usually I am more interested in getting out of the physical but in this particular case I actually felt very safe in the physical because the the entity could perhaps mess with my head a little if I allowed it to uh, could mess with my some maybe some information energy information technology information signals perhaps it could mess with that too but on the physical level I felt very secure but it also made me realize that the data if it's messing with my data the only way or the, the sure way to ensure that it can't be messed with is to imprint it physically in more locations now in the in the in the data world that means writing it to a hard drive which itself the hard drive is physical but of course the signal is still just a a magnetic signal or or a, a, an electronic signal that is stored in some medium but it's still in the physical realm so I just started getting into the habit every time I made a change boom I hit the button it moved it to all of my different locations and the weirdness went away the, the crazy weird little rearranging of words and sentences disappearing all of that stopped so I, th I, I'm, I think that's I think that's what happened but the real takeaway from that is that the physical world is kind of a safe space for <clears throat> um, certain um, a safe space in in the in the, in the multi-dimensional world of the various planes of existence the physical world is a, is uh, is a safe space uh, so anyway that's that story